Good afternoon. Um, I'm Alon Confino. I'm the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. I'd like to welcome you um, for our conversation with Lawrence Douglas about his new book, Will He Go? Trump and the Looming Election Meltdown. Uh, not all talks are born equal and uh, this talk has a, a splendid, uh, timely um, character to it following the debate last night. Uh, before we start, let me say a few things. The Institute have start, uh, has started a new program uh, with the Institute for Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University. The program is called Encounters, and it will have every month or so, uh, two scholars will talk about a new book um, in the field of the Holocaust, mass violence, and others. We're going to start it in a few weeks. And we're going to send out our uh, program. I also would like to remind you to visit our website and Facebook for more announcements and updates, and that we have a YouTube channel. The channel name is uh, IHGMS UMass Amherst, where you can see this recording and all other recordings, and you can also share the videos on Facebook and others. Next week, we are going to have a very different event. It's going to be an event about the role of uh, Moses Mendelssohn in Jewish history and remembrance uh, from the 18th century to the present. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Lawrence Douglas, who is the James Grossfield Professor of Law, Jurisprudence and Social Thought at Amherst College, as well as a writer for The Guardian. Douglas's work has been characterized by creative scholarship and imaginative narration. He is the prize-winning author of seven books, including The Memory of Judgment, Making Law and History in the Trials of the Holocaust, and The Right Wrong Man, John Demianiuk and the Last Great Nazi War Crime Trial, which was a New York Times editor's choice. In addition, and unlike most scholars, Douglas has also published two acclaimed novels, The Catastrophe, a Kirkus Best Book of the Year, and The Vices, a finalist for the National Jewish Book Prize, both focused on issues of Jewish identity and other issues of identity. His most recent book is Will He Go? Trump and the looming election meltdown. Um, yesterday, we all, or most of us, watched the debate. And one of the last segments, perhaps even the last question, was to Donald Trump um, about the elections, about the regularity of the elections, about election fraud, and about whether he will concede and whether he will accept the election results. We all know his answers, which just make this book ever more timely and the situation, I would say, quite alarming. So I'd like to welcome Lawrence and start by asking him maybe to lay out briefly what is the main argument of the book, the main storyline and um, uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for uh, having me uh, alone. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you this afternoon. Um, you know, I, I actually, I started writing the book uh, as something of a, of a thought experiment. Um, I was, uh, as I think many, American, uh, uh, many Americans were, I was pretty alarmed back in uh, 2016 at the time of uh, Trump's and Hillary Clinton's last debate. And back then, you might uh, remember, this was the same uh, moderator, uh, Chris Wallace, asked Trump whether he would uh, accept an electoral defeat. And again, back in 2016, he uh, demurred. And um, he refused to say that he would. At the time, I remember being absolutely flabbergasted to hear a um, candidate of a major party 
um, refused to say that he would acknowledge electoral defeat. And uh, actually, at the time, I thought, oh, well, this guy has just nailed his coffin shut. I mean, we would be in such peril this country if we had a Donald Trump who wasn't so obviously self-destructive, but this guy is so self-destructive, there's no way that he's going to be elected after coming out with a statement like that. But then after he was elected, I, I started really thinking about, um, well, how well is our system equipped to deal with a president who uh, might uh, reject electoral defeat? And so the book started when I first started researching it as something of a, of a thought experiment of really just trying to ask, um, well, how well is our system of, let's say, constitutional and federal law equipped to deal with a, uh, this type of president? And I think the disturbing answer that I came to is that our system is not well equipped at all to deal with this kind of precedent uh, and is not well equipped to deal with someone who is, uh, in particular, is going to uh, challenge electoral uh, defeat or, or reject electoral defeat. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I, I try to make clear in the book is that um, our system it, it really doesn't uh, secure the peaceful succession of power. It, it presupposes the peaceful succession of power. That is to say, it, it, it kind of assumes that it will occur. It's not as if there are these uh, elaborate constitutional and legal means in place to uh, guarantee that peaceful succession. Um, there are, you know, certainly various laws uh, and constitutional norms in place. But again, it's, they're, they're ones that kind of can just sort of control the electoral system rather than troubleshoot defiance to it. And so uh, in, a, in a certain way, uh, the kind of threat that Donald Trump represents is um, something that I could say our system simply is not particularly well equipped uh, to deal with. So maybe I'll just kind of leave it at that as, as kind of the, the general uh, overview. Okay. Let me say that uh, Lawrence and I will discuss for about 30 minutes or so, or 40 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for uh, questions. And you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a, um, there is a tab there that uh, Q&A, and you can write your questions there, and I will moderate. So in the book, you mention a few scenarios, what might happen if Trump does not concede and does not leave. Can you elaborate a little bit about what, what are actually the constitutional problems and hurdles uh, or non-existence uh, issues that, um, that we face? Right. So, you know, as I said along, the book kind of uh, evolved almost out of this thought experiment of, you know, again, how well is the system designed to deal with such a precedent? And so I tried to imagine kind of three, um, what I describe as these kind of catastrophe uh, scenarios. I guess you already mentioned that I wrote a novel called The Catastrophe. So you can see that my imagination <laughs> already, it heads in the direction of catastrophe rather naturally. So, you know, I tried to imagine these three uh, catastrophe scenarios. And uh, one of the scenarios involved the possibility of uh, faithless electors, and we could go into a uh, more detailed discussion of that if you'd like. Uh, another scenario imagined uh, the possibility of, um, of let's say, a, a particular um, crucial um, voting error in a swing state being subject to a, um, a hack or some kind of uh, targeted attack on the uh, power infrastructure. But then the third one, the third one I have to say, is the one that has me most concerned, because in that one, I imagined a situation in which Trump has a lead on election day, but in which mail-in ballots, which mm -hmm. are counted after the fact, lead to the erosion of his lead. And it seems like what I was imagining as one possible catastrophe scenario, in fact, bears a lot of similarity to something that I, I'm afraid we are more than likely to see. To see That is, it really seems as if Trump has, um, you know, one thing about Trump is he doesn't particularly hide his plans. He doesn't particularly, he's not exactly what we just call a, a discreet, a person who is uh, plotting things uh, in silence. I mean, he's pretty public in announcing what his plans are. 
And I think if we connect two dots, uh, one dot is the fact that he's already started um, uh, tweeting that uh, because the count of mail-in ballots is going to be delayed, um, that we need to go with the November 3rd results. And secondly, that he's tried to discredit the mail-in ballots as uh, being uh, no doubt contaminated by fraud. If we connect those dots, we really see the beginning of a strategy that looks a lot like this catastrophe scenario number three, that is Trump trying to leverage a lead that he own that he might have on November 3rd um, into a claim of victory and then trying to discount the erosion of that lead as the product of a, um, a hoax as perpetrated by the nefarious radical Democrats. So in this case, what can we do in order to move him from the White House, which he lost in, in the election. I mean, how, how, how secure are we that at the end there will be a happy end? Um, I, I, I have reasons to be, um, given the fact that I have this catastrophic imagination, um, is it possible, can I imagine ways in which things end um, non-catastrophically? And the answer is, yeah, I, I can imagine non-catastrophic outcomes. I think the best possible outcome. And it's a little bit of, uh, I, I think, what um, Joe Biden tried to uh, tell uh, the television audience last night. If Trump loses decisively, then I think his opportunities to engage in this kind of constitutional brinkmanship will be limited. Now, that, of course, raises the question of what we mean by a decisive loss, uh, because obviously losing decisively in the popular vote is not enough in this country, um, given the peculiar, uh, archaic, and uh, arguably dysfunctional way that we go about electing a president. Um, obviously, uh, he could lose the popular vote decisively and still win the electoral college vote. Um, so I think what would be critical is for that him to lose decisively in the electoral college, and for that decisive loss also to be clear in the swing states and for it to be clear relatively soon after November 3rd. Now, it's likely not to be clear on November 3rd itself. And that, of course, is why uh, um, Chris Wallace pointedly asked both candidates at the end of the debate, will you hereby pledge not to declare yourself a winner until all the votes have been counted and independently certified? And again, Biden very quickly answered yes, and very noticeably Trump refused to answer at all. In fact, then went off on one of his patented diatribes against the, um, the integrity of mail-in ballots. So again, I think a decisive loss will, um, will at least spare us the worst of the kind of damage that I think Trump could do. I think even in the case of the decisive loss, I, I, I don't imagine Trump uh, actually conceding defeat. And by conceding defeat, I mean, I don't imagine him actually recognizing the legitimacy of his loss. Uh, I just don't think it's in his DNA ever to recognize that he's lost in a legitimate and fair uh, contest. But even if he doesn't concede, I think he'll have to submit to defeat. That is, I think, will realize that a further fight will be a futile. And my hope is that actually other uh, Republican lawmakers would in fact pressure him uh, to go as well. So I think that's the best possible outcome we can imagine. So this outcome would have been unimaginable four years ago. Four years ago, when he, did, uh, when, when he answered, as he answered in the debate with, uh, with Hillary Clinton, you couldn't believe that he would be elected president. Now he is president and he says it every day that the elections are rigged. So my question is, we, we are historians. My question is, maybe we are so much within the process that we don't see that actually the situation is much graver than even we think. Because if he does not concede the election, if he tells his supporters, you know, these elections were rigged, violence is permitted, you can do many things 
In America, there are a lot of people with guns, there are a lot of militias. So it can be that the scenario that you are depicting is actually, even if Biden at the end is in the White House on January 20th, there will be a segment of the American population that will delegitimize the election in such a way that the political system here will become uh, very unstable. I think that your, the point you're making is, is an exceptionally important one. Because I think one of the, uh, I think one of the most toxic things about this incredibly toxic president is uh, the fact that, as you've mentioned, he has systematically um, sought to erode the confidence that Americans have in the integrity of our electoral system. And uh, that's an incredibly dangerous game to play. And it's a dangerous game to play because if, uh, let's say, uh, tens of millions of his supporters buy into that narrative, then any attempt to, um, to reject his defeat and to stay in the White House can be packaged as a attempt to preserve democracy rather than to usurp it. And, uh, and uh, the other thing I think is it's a very difficult thing to, to um, walk back. I mean, legitimacy is just a kind of a key, key um, undergirding of a, a system of uh, democratic constitutionalism. And the erosion of legitimacy, basically, um, you can no longer have a, um, a successful constitutional or thriving or healthy constitutional um, democracy in the absence of a belief on the part of the people that the system is legitimate. And of course, the most basic, even if people, let's say, despise the way Congress works, they have to have some basic faith in the electoral process itself. And uh, that's just an incredibly toxic legacy of what this president has done. And, um, you know, combine that with the statement that we were, heard him make uh, last night uh, when he was asked to repudiate um, white supremacists. Um, and again, he kind of refused to do so and then rather coyly uh, said to the Proud Boys, uh, stand down and stand by. Uh, basically kind of almost making them into a, you know, power, you know, paramilitary reserve um, at the ready to uh, listen to whatever kind of dog whistles he sends out um, when he tries to insist that the um, election has been stolen from him. Very, very dangerous situation. So it seems to me that the, the main takeaway from, or one main takeaway from your book is that we are at the precipice. We are really at the, looking at the, at the historical turning point, perhaps in American history, that will demand a really particular set of legal, political circumstances to get out of peacefully. Um, do you think that there is a way that the Supreme Court, what will be the role of the Supreme Court in this kind of a crisis? Can the Supreme Court uh, actually paradoxically save us because its decision will be accepted or it is just part of the problem? Well, I think, let's say that there is some kind of um, electoral dispute. Uh, and it's not unlikely that there could be about the counting of mail-in ballots, about whether mail-in ballots have been uh, properly uh, qualified, because there are these laws that require mail-in ballots to arrive by a certain date, and there'll no doubt be litigation. Um, and if that litigation, if, if the, the count of mail-in ballots uh, could be decisive in terms of the overall uh, outcome of the election, let's say it all turns on the count of mail-in ballots in Michigan, and the mail-in ballots become subject to litigation. Could that litigation go to the Supreme Court? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, it could. I mean, we saw a similar thing happen in the year 2000 in the, the Bush-Gore uh, Bush uh, contest. I would say that the only way the only way that the Supreme Court could even come close to diffusing the situation is if it rendered a verdict that uh, was not to Trump's liking. 
Mm -hmm. And the reason, of course, I say that is because the Supreme Court looks to many Americans as if it's been stacked with, um, with uh, Trump's nominees. And so, you know, there might be a kind of an important symbolic um, act on the part of the Supreme Court demonstrating that even very conservative justices remain dedicated to the basic constitutional system. And, uh, and so if they actually um, voted in a manner that, again, was not to Trump's liking, uh, that could be an important, uh, I, I think, kind of restorative act. Yes. On the other hand, if they inserted themselves in the election in a manner that broke in Trump's favor, given the fact that we're now seeing this, uh, you know, this 11th hour nominee being rushed through in this kind of transparent act of hypocrisy by uh, Senate Republicans, and obviously under the, the stewardship of Mitch McConnell, then I would think that a Supreme Court decision would have no legitimacy whatsoever and would only uh, kind of add fuel to, uh, add fuel to the fire. I prepared the question, I think you answered it, but I want to ask it nonetheless. Do you see a scenario in which Trump actually accepts the election results after making some problems? So at the beginning, he will say no, but after a week or 10 days, he, he will accept it because, um, because he will not have a choice, because maybe he will strike a deal about his finances or about maybe he will give himself a pardon before leaving the White House. But can it be that he's a gambler and he's now saying all this also in order to, to have an excuse as to why he lost? So he would concede but say, I lost and I'm going, and it's because the, the, uh, the elections were rigged, and I'm going now to my business. Do you see this as, an, as, a, as a possibility or not at all? Right, so Alon, I, I, that's, so maybe this just gives me an opportunity to kind of um, say again what I think is an important distinction because I think the question is an important one. So, you know, I, I do in, in the book, for example, draws the distinction between conceding and submitting. And so again, conceding, I imagine, as it's kind of almost more of a normative act where you, you know, you recognize the legitimacy of your loss and you kind of, you know, you shake hands and we fought the good fight, you prevailed, I recognize that you won legitimately. I cannot imagine Trump doing that. I simply find it impossible to imagine that mm -hmm. he would take the high road. Uh, and I think it also has to do with, you know, brand protection. He always needs to be either the winner or he needs to be the victim, the victim of these conspiratorial forces. So I think no matter what the outcome, I think you will always blame it on a hoax. And, and in fact, I think we have reason to believe this. If you go all the way back to 2016, uh, when Trump was just a candidate, very early on in the nomination process, um, he lost the Iowa caucus to Senator Ted Cruz from Texas. And the very next morning, he was out there tweeting, Ted Cruz did not beat me, it was a hoax, he cheated, and the results should be overturned. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, to go to your other point, can I imagine him submitting to defeat? Can I imagine him saying, well, okay, it was all a hoax, but I'm gonna, you know, pack up and I'm um, gonna, you know, go with to, um, I'm gonna join Sean Hannity, start a television network, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be a gadfly for the rest of my life, attacking the administration. Yes, I, I, again, I can imagine that particularly if the margin of his defeat is, is pretty decisive. So that's why I say, I think that's kind of the best case scenario in which he does, you know, submit to defeat. I'd like to ask a few questions about how you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. So about the sources, did you, did you interview or meet people that, um, that you can't tell us who, who they are? <laughs> uh, you, you have a lot of quotes in the book. Uh, also from Trump and other people. Um, um, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Right. So um, 
You know, I certainly uh, did the research like uh, we all do research by, you know, reading and things like that. But I did, of course, uh, conduct interviews. Uh, some of the people I interviewed, their names um, I can, you know, are in the book. Yes. Uh, some were not simply because they're asking to be um, interviewed on background or off the record. Uh, some of them were, um, uh, for example, um, rather high up people in the Obama administration, uh, senior officials in the Obama administration. Uh, administration. Some of them were um, lawyers who um, are kind of experts in uh, electoral law. Some of them were um, military figures because I was interested in kind of talking to um, leading military figures to see um, how they imagine a, a situation playing out in which, um, you know, the commander in chief um, is trying to, in a sense, defy the will of the people. Um, so, uh, and the other thing that I, I really benefited from, because I really should make clear that, you know, I'm not, uh, I, at Amherst College, um, you know, I've, I've, for years I've taught a course on the rule of law, and I've taught a course on uh, American constitutionalism, but I'm not an expert on electoral law, so I really did benefit from uh, conversations with election law experts, and I also was able to observe and participate in uh, several workshops that people uh, had organized for the purposes of trying to kind of troubleshoot and imagine out uh, some of the uh, kind of scenarios of the way elections can go sideways. Um, and the other thing I guess I should mention about the way I wrote the book is uh, quickly. Um, quickly and with I the I was wondering need, about that. <laughs> yes. And, and with the need actually to be, uh, you know, somewhat flexible with things. When I started writing the book, and in fact, I, I think I, in early chapters, I had... Um, you know, laid out again that this is somewhat of a thought experiment and that at present writing, it seems that Trump is not unlikely uh, to be reelected because he's riding a very strong economy. And um, so this is just simply a, a kind of way of thinking what could happen if for something, if some, you know, unforeseen circumstances intervene. Now, of course, unforeseen circumstances did intervene. And so I immediately got the uh, proofs of the book back uh, from the press and did some rewriting to uh, yeah. update the, um, the book, uh, you know, to reflect the realities of the, the COVID pandemic, which of course has both made Trump a, you know, a far more vulnerable candidate a far, far more vulnerable candidate, but in that sense, also a far more dangerous candidate. Right. Yeah. So I thought that you wrote the book indeed quickly, and I was wondering what was the, what was the, the reigning emotions? Rage? Uh, uh, worrying? Uh, you know, yeah, what was the, whether there was a, a reigning emotion as you, as you, as you wrote it? You know, th this is maybe kind of uh, a little odd to say, but um, because as, as you mentioned at the very outset of today's conversation that, you know, in the past I've written a couple of books about um, trials involving uh, perpetrators and collaborators in Nazi genocide. And so these are also not necessarily the happiest uh, topics to write about. Uh, along with, uh, you know, the possible existential threats to American democracy. Uh, I, I happen to say just for myself that I find the writing process quite therapeutic. Mm. So the actual, you know, I know colleagues who, you know, say they hate writing, they like having written it, but they hate the actual writing. I actually quite enjoy the process of writing. And, and I do find that it, it's a way of uh, almost kind of sublimating the, um, the concerns and worries that I have um, at the, uh, you know, when I think about the issue. So when I'm writing, I'm, I'm not so much possessed by that spirit of worry as much as as soon as I'm finished. And uh, for example, I, I don't know what your uh, somatic response was to watching the, uh, the debate last night, but, you know, I, I felt like I was under, you know, my, my heart was pounding, my blood pressure was yeah. rising. I was so you know, kind of upset by what the, the, the horrible display. So, so the, the writing helps, I think, kind of sublimate that, at least for a while. I have to confess that I identify with you. Uh, uh, you know, when I write about Israel-Palestine, it seems to me that I am solving all the problems. Yeah, yeah. 
only afterwards, when I finish the writing, I see that well, the problems are still there. But the, the text is, it helps me go through. Right. Right. I I was yesterday the debate. I was just so scared, scared at the beginning when I didn't know how it's going to end. Also, I I was scared. That I was I was afraid that Trump is going to go all over Biden. It was mm-hmm. not clear how Biden. So so having watched the debate, you know, with the, with the, with the debate and with your book, and when you look now at your book following the debate, what, do you, what, what would you say are the main takeaways that you would like readers um, to take from, from the book? Um, you know, I, I suppose there are a number of things. I mean, one thing is, first of all, I mean, I, maybe this is the most obvious uh, thing that, um, I mean, I would be very happy if people read the book and, um, and if they thought, for example, I mean, there's certainly a, a, a substantial uh, contingent of, let's say, progressive uh, voters out there uh, for whom Biden is not, the, um, not their favorite uh, candidate. Um, you know, at the most basic level, I, I think this is a, a code red moment for American democracy. Uh, so, uh, you know, anyone who thinks that, oh, well, the difference between Biden and Trump you know, Biden's also one of these career politicians. I think you've got to, um, I think it is absolutely critical to rally behind Biden. And so, I mean, I think, you know, again, uh, maybe one of the most um, uh, basic takeaways is, you know, to get out there and either vote, organize voters, uh, organize uh, poll watching, organize in whatever way um, is, um, agreeable to you to make sure that this election doesn't go seriously, seriously sideways. I guess another thing is just to kind of, you know, I I think we just kind of assume that the peaceful succession of power is kind of an inevitable quality of a, of, um, of a political system. And I think maybe one of the things that the book is tries to instill in people is to realize what a, um, what a kind of fragile and important gift that is mm-hmm. and that uh, it needs to be kind of vigilantly protected and can't simply be uh, routinely assumed. Um, and maybe the third thing, and this is again something that gets a little bit more technical, is hopefully, you know, I don't think we'd be worrying about this election so much if we had like a national popular vote, if we didn't right. have such a you know, archaic mechanism for electing the president. And so, you know, hopefully maybe it can also um, lead to some kind of additional conversation about electoral reform, which I think is um, kind of 200 years past uh, when it should have been done by. Let me ask one more question before I, uh, uh, we're going to open the floor and we already have some questions. So the book has, has received a lot of attention uh, with um, articles at the New York Review of Books and the TLS and many others. I was wondering if the Biden campaign uh, approached you <laughs> to, uh, to discuss the book and its, uh, and its implications. Um. I, you know, I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. I have been contacted by people. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to go into it. But yes, I, I have been contacted by So you can say no, no comment. <laughs> and and we, will, uh, we will understand. Uh, sounds good. Okay. Because I hope that they have read the book. Well, and, yeah, yeah. And, and will consult you. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we have a question. Um, how the confirmation of Trump's Supreme Court nominee, assuming she is confirmed, can affect the outcome of the election? Well, I, I, I think we, we touched on this a little bit alone, right? So uh, it is possible that some kind of election dispute um, could be kicked up to the Supreme Court. Um, and it is possible the Supreme Court would, would have to decide it. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, if the court um, broke with a majority in favor of Trump, I think that would be 
per widely, widely perceived as a illegitimate uh, insertion of the court into our electoral politics. And on the other hand, I think if the court, uh, despite the fact that it has, that is an overwhelmingly conservative court, I mean, you really have to go back probably till the early years of the uh, Roosevelt administration to find a court as uh, conservative as the present Supreme Court, that if they decided against Trump, then I think that would be, uh, I would hope that would be a, um, a uh, legitimizing uh, decision that could possibly gain uh, bipartisan uh, support. Do you see Trump using force to stay in power? Could, could we look like Belarus? I, you know, I don't see, you know, I, I, I don't imagine Trump as, you know, barricading himself in the Oval Office, uh, you know, come uh, January 20th. Um, if it, for example, uh, Biden has been duly inaugurated as President of the United States, then he's the commander in chief. And as of noon on January 20th, according to the Constitution, uh, Trump is a civilian. And so I, I can't, I, I don't really see that that much as a danger. The thing that I think becomes really dangerous is first of all, the period between November 3rd and January 20th. During that period, uh, Trump remains the uh, president, uh, even if as a lame duck. And we could certainly imagine civil unrest roiling this country. And should civil unrest roil the country while the count of mail-in ballots is continuing, that could be an incredibly destabilizing thing. And what we've also seen, going all the way back to Lafayette Square, is uh, Trump's uh, willingness to uh, use um, federal force in a very uh, extreme and, um, and, and aggravated fashion. And, uh, and, and I think this is something that Joe Biden mentioned uh, last night, that Trump really is not interested in using um, federal force for the purposes of establishing peace. I think he's interested in using it to create ever greater divisions among us and to actually trigger uh, violence itself. There is a question here that like to shift our focus from the national to the local, town, county, city, state elections that will also be hotly contested. Um, what do you see as the possible ripple effect of multiple contestations on the local level of various states? It's, it's an excellent question. And uh, it gets a little bit into also kind of some of the uh, technical ways that the election really could get very, very complicated. Um, because um, as the questioner points out, um, the down ballot races are going to be subject to the same kinds of um, disputes over the count of mail-in ballots that the presidential election could be um, subject to. And that could actually uh, have a, a very dramatic ripple effect because it's not impossible to imagine that an electoral dispute um, involving the presidential election would land in Congress's lap. And Congress basically, uh, according to the Constitution, has the ultimate say in um, counting electoral college votes and in certifying the winner. And they would uh, do this on January 6th, uh, 2021. But if the down ballot elections remain um, uh, contested, then it might be unclear as to, for example, who has captured the Senate. Mm -hmm. And if it remains unclear who has captured the Senate, then that could really lead to tremendous problems if uh, the presidential dispute ends up in congressional hands. Because then we really see the whole system uh, starting to uh, melt down. Because we can see a scenario in which not only the presidential elections are being contested, but also many 
places around the country in which lawyers of Biden and of Trump yes. will go to court. And this can go on for weeks. Exactly. And at least in the case of the presidential election, there, there are certain hard dates that, um, that uh, you know, the states, according to federal law, really should figure out their election disputes by uh, December 8th. That is a, it's a date that's actually set long time ago in this Electoral uh, College Act, uh, the Electoral Count Act of uh, 1887. And this particular election season, the date by which the uh, states um, really need to figure out who has carried the state is December 8th. And, you know, that's five weeks after the election. And if you look, for example, simply at the 12th Congressional District in New York, in their recent primary, it took them six weeks to figure out who won that primary. So there are reasons for concern. Well, that can be a situation in which the the presidential election actually will be decided by December 8th, but there will be many contested local and state elections. We will not know the, the composition of the Congress, the House of Representatives and of the Senate. This is a, this exactly. Is a, no, that, that's very possible. And where you can really imagine the contest becoming exceptionally bitter is with regards to senatorial races. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it could really turn on one or two senators, whether the Democrats, for example, um, you know, basically have a unified government or not. And uh, so that could really turn into a very, very acrimonious contest as well. What is the role that you see of Mitch McConnell in orchestrating this situation that we are in and maybe um, some prediction as to how he might behave after November 3rd, depending on the various scenarios? Right. Well, my hope, and again, I don't know if uh, the participants in this webinar uh, now think of me as a starry-eyed optimist, but (laughs) my hope, my hope is that um, this um, uh, infinitely cynical uh, uh, senator from uh, Kentucky would actually pressure Trump to submit to defeat if it seems like the election is decisive. Mm -hmm. Uh, The one thing in which I could imagine, again, if the election starts to turn on these very narrow margins uh, in a handful of swing states and uh, and those um, margins or those votes end up becoming, you know, litigated, uh, I could imagine uh, Mitch McConnell and other Senate Republicans like uh, Lindsey Graham you know, supporting Trump in at least in his, uh, in all the kind of litigation that he brings uh, for the purposes of trying to contest what looks like um, relatively close results. And so, you know, I do think, and I think the point that the question you're asking is a really important one because I think a lot of how this country survives in the next months does not turn exclusively on Trump. It turns on how uh, the Senate Republicans Act as well, and other Senate and other Republican lawmakers. Right. It reminds us that that it's not so much that Trump behaved as he behaved, but that the Republican Party and people that we considered serious people in the Republican Party have accepted it, and accepted it after before in nineteen in twenty sixteen said that they don't support Trump, that he behaves terribly, that he speaks terribly. And um, so this group of helpers, uh, they were not bystanders. They really, they really helped Trump and uh, helped deteriorate the, the system here to where we are now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think many of us have been, um, you know, waiting for the moment um, with, you know, Godot-like persistence for the uh, senators to show some kind of uh, backbone. But, you know, and and I think what we've really learned, it's not just cowardice. Um, It's basically a kind of cynicism and um, 
and opportunism. Yeah. Um, so and I think they've really been, uh, you know, these kind of willing accessories in uh, Trump's kind of uh, assault on basic norms of our, of our system. Yeah. There is a question here about historical comparisons. If you can think of a, um, thinking about the past, um, if there are other cases in the world in recent history or modern history, in other countries' histories, that um, there, were, there, are, there are models for the death of democracy that we see in this country, or really, this is a very, this is a particular, not a unique case, but this is a particular case to the United States, so it's on time and, um, and it's on space, and it's, and it's difficult to compare. You know, I, I think maybe given the kinds of um, intellectual concerns that we share, there's always, you know, what I call my students, uh, I tell my students is the reductio ad nauseum. Right. So, Weimar. Well, yeah, <laughs> Weimar. Yes, exactly. Weimar. So it's always that kind of reductio ad nauseum. It's like everything always, you know, that becomes the, uh, the uh, classic uh, case. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the United States um, has a much more vibrant um, uh, constitutional culture and democratic culture than Weimar Germany ever had and much, much stronger institutions. And uh, you've seen, for example, uh, you know, we've seen obviously disturbing things over the past uh, several years, but we've also seen, uh, you know, notwithstanding the many picks that uh, Trump has had in the federal judiciary, we've seen uh, courts pushing back at times very aggressively against uh, the Trump administration. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think I would resist a little bit um, what I think is maybe kind of the, too quick move to compare us to uh, Weimar. Um, you know, I think there's certainly parallels that can be drawn between a Trump and like a Berlusconi in Italy. Um, and, um, you know, the way Berlusconi also kind of eroded, um, you know, Italian democracy. Though, again, I would say that Italian democracy did not have the same kind of um, um, vibrant um, constitutional uh, tradition that we have. Um, of course, you can flip it around and realize we've, lot, we've learned something really, really frightening about our system, which is norms that we thought would have some kind of restraint. Well, Trump has just been able to kind of blow through those norms and not suffer any political price whatsoever. So, um, you know, I think that is something that has left many, many, uh, you know, observers and actors deeply troubled is the way in which, you know, in particular, I think the, uh, the media environment in which we operate mm -hmm. has really kind of eroded, you know, basic um, uh, civil discourse in this country. And it comes both in the form of, you know, things like, um, you know, Sean Hannity and Fox, which almost functions as a form of alternative uh, information or state-run propaganda for Trump. And then, of course, these uh, social media platforms that many of us all uh, participate in, uh, that they have really um, been very, very destructive to, um, to uh, civil discourse and to um, the kind of uh, community of knowledge that makes a democracy possible. Your point about norms strikes me as crucial because what I think took many of us by surprise is how quickly democratic norms and what was seen to us as, as just a given was, uh, was, well, was overturned by a man who we and many Americans obviously see as, as a sham, as a bully, as a... Um, it means that the precariousness of these norms in American society has been deep, that uh, these norms were not that uh, secure. So I'm thinking the crisis is going to stay with us even if Trump will submit. 
And if on January 20th, it's going to be Joe Biden, and maybe even the Senate will be them by, uh, ruled by the Democrats and the House of Re Representatives. We, we cannot just flip the coin and go back to 2016 or 2015. This is a new country um, with new problems. Um, we yes. are historians, we look at the past, but here I'm trying to look uh, at the future. How, what do you think the administration or uh, social groups should do about it? What things should be changed? Maybe constitutional uh, things, the electoral uh, system, because these problems are going to remain regardless of whether Trump leaves or not. How, yes. how, how, do, we, how do we face this? You know, I, I think, um... In a way, I mean, it's not as if I have any particular, you know, brilliant insight as to how to kind of, and I think the, the point that you're making is absolutely right, because it's not a process of just walking things back, because walking things back suggests, you know, some kind of return. And, um, and I don't think we can really do that. It's a way of, you know, how can we try to, um, to uh, re-inhabit and to revive a, a scarred landscape. It's almost like, um, you know, if you think about California, I mean, the, the fire has broken out and a lot of acreage has been consumed. And now the question is, you know, what are we gonna do with this landscape? We just can't pretend it hasn't happened. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think one thing that at least, uh, this is just from, again, I'm just kind of uh, free associating in a certain way, is I think, you know, things from a ground up level can be very helpful instead of, you know, looking uh, to Washington and, uh, you know, trying to engage in some kind of, you know, exercises of community repair, create, you know, community dialogue groups where people across the aisle try to, or people of different, you know, political persuasions try to have some kind of conversation to find some, uh, you know, uh, commonalities with one another. Uh, because I think that type of, you know, the establishment of, you know, maybe community ties more on the local level um, can be a, a, a somewhat what healing um, thing for the country, which has been, you know, so badly um, divided uh, by this kind of partisan hatred. Lawrence, I was wondering about the readership of the book. So, of course, I can imagine that a lot of... Uh, Trump non-supporters, Democrats read the book. But is it also the case that Trump supporters read the book and maybe they write you and uh, in other events, they ask uh, questions, what kind of questions they ask, what, what, what concerns them, do they refute your arguments? Um, so, or, or is the readership quite large, but quite bounded in its, in its ideology? You know, I, I, I hate to kind of answer the question in the following way. I certainly have heard from people from the, um, who are, let's say, Trump supporters. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's a little bit of, you know, a, a consequence of this um, animized, I'm not sure if animized is the right word, but the kind of the anonymity that we all enjoy now uh, through, again, social media contacts. So instead of, um, uh, instead of having uh, arguments about, well, you know, I, I really kind of wonder why you said this or that, I, I hate to say it, it takes more of the, the form of go fuck yourself, you piece, you know, that kind of, I mean, I hate to say it in that, perfectly <laughs> that, that, is a, that tends to be a little bit more of, you know, of the kinds of, uh, comments that I, I receive. And if they are from, um, um, you know, other professors, and I have received from professors, I also find the, the comments kind of dispiritingly um, uh, kind of ad hominem as opposed to engaging. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, yeah, it's sort of almost a little well, larger, against, you know, the larger kind of um, ad hominem against, you know, me or, you know, something like that. Um, and, um, so again, this, it's, it's sort of this kind of disappointing erosion of dialogue and of discussion. Um, and, um, that we are speaking more and more only within our own groups. 
just like our Facebook friends are all yeah. people who feel more or less like us. There is an echo chamber. And, and, the, and, the, and the conversation across groups takes the form of shouting and cursing. Mm -hmm. But is there at all a conversation of, of across groups in, in events for your book or or mainly it doesn't happen because the, 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 the audience is so uniformly... Uh, well, that, no, that's true. I, I would say in some of the conversations, the audience has been a little bit different. Hmm. Um, but um, some of the differences have been a little bit more, I, I would say the kinds of um, pushbacks I've received are, are uh, more on the institutional level than on the, uh, the, the level of, let's say what I'm saying about um, uh, Trump. I mean, because I certainly have encountered people, for example, who uh, are offering defenses of the Electoral College. I mean, I try to, you know, in the relatively short compass of the book, essay a critique of the Electoral College, and yes. certainly have people, you know, pushing back against that. And um, so the, I, I think it, you know, I mm -hmm. certainly have Republicans uh, who have responded, but they tend to be, again, more of the never Trumpers, but, um, but people who have a different understanding of the, the kind of institutions and have maybe more faith in our electoral institutions than, than um, or the electoral college than I do. So are there any words of comfort? Uh... <laughs> I, you know, I do. Or, or we are, or we, or we are really, we are really going to be worried. Okay. You know, I, I, it's it's so interesting because you know I think for um, for many of us, you know, when we think back to uh, which now seems like ages ago when Obama was president, um, you know, the country didn't seem to be entirely healthy, but we seem to be in, in certain regards in, in the right track. Um, so, uh, you know, and I do think we need to remind ourselves that, um, you know, at no point over the last three and a half years has this president um, had a majority of support among Americans. And, uh, you know, the opposition to him has remained, you know, very steady. The support for him has remained very steady as well. I mean, we can be uh, disturbed by the erosion, by the failure of that support to erode, but I, I think we can take some comfort for the fact that, you know, a very substantial majority of Americans seem to oppose him and that hopefully the voice of that um, substantial majority will make itself heard in this election and that, uh, and that we will be able to, um, you know, have a succession of power, which is relatively without trauma and that permits us to try to uh, confront the problems that I think we both agree are not about to go away. Right. Okay, Lawrence. It was wonderful. Oh, my pleasure. And enlightening. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that we uh, we ended on a on a positive note. Yes. After all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me along. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye, Bye. Oh. Yes. Oh, never mind. It's okay. Never mind. Yes, no, go. No, I was, people are probably already leaving, but I just want to say that if, if um, anyone um, is inclined to buy the book, I just want to mention that I'm donating everything I earn to the Hunger Project. So I'm not in this for personal enrichment. So I just want to mention that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.